may be one of the worst mistakes the West has made in discussing Islamist terrorism is to paint the terrorists as deadly, sophisticated geniuses. In truth, there is nothing sophisticated about them. They are dangerous, but not in a manner of James Bond or Bruce Lee, no matter how much they would like to think so. Their danger is more of the kind of an Inspector Clouseau, clueless, hapless amateurs who flail about and cause untold damage with a combination of fervent zeal and amateurism. We need only watch their videos, immediately to see into their immature psyche and to comprehend just as what they would like to be seen. Ninjas. Shadowy, scary, deadly super-warriors. Yes, here we are dealing with a bunch of semi-literate buffoons who have watched a few too many martial arts movies. I mean, look at them. Do they really think this looks military? I didn't know that the US Navy SEALs or the SAS did choreographed gymnastics. Maybe what this piece needs is a dance number. You know, a sort of Islamist Boney M or ABBA, or the village people. Then these guys here could be their dance support act, pointing guns and sashaying about rhythmically. Anything you view about Islamic terrorists makes it abundantly clear that they fervently wish to be feared. They equate this with respect. These are the sort of knuckle-dragging goons in inner cities, who try to initiate a fight by demanding to know whether their counterpart is dissing them. But much as they would like to think of themselves as a Muslim version of Dirty Harry, staring down the barrel of a high-powered gun, asking their opposite number whether he feels lucky today, they really just come across as juveniles who are trying too hard. So what is the very last thing we ought to do regarding terrorists? We ought not grant them the credibility they seek, for it is our validation they crave. They dream of being on telly, preferably described as some shadowy superkiller with robot arms and a laser on his shoulder. You know, the sort of action hero figure they got for their birthday once, when they were nine. Now, if you do not believe me, and you really trust that these men are sophisticated hunter-killers, please let me give you an example or two. Please let me introduce you to Nicky Riley, the Exeter Café Bomber. This deadly ninja superkiller wished to blow up the Giraffe Café in Exeter in 2008. After all, who has not heard of the famous Giraffe Café in Exeter and its national strategic importance? Clearly this was a carefully chosen target, the destruction of which would severely undermine Britain's ability to function. In order to prime his device, Nicky Riley visited the café's toilet facilities. Guests were suddenly alerted by one big, almighty bang. Later, when the security forces extricated our charred and singed would-be martyr from his toilet cubicle, it became clear that this had been an attempted Islamic martyrdom operation. Muhammad Abdulaziz Rashid Saeed Alim, a.k.a. Nicky Riley, was discharged from hospital four days later, and of course went to prison. In fact, he has since died in prison. According to the Daily Telegraph, Mr. Riley was described by law enforcement agencies as the least cunning person ever to have been charged with terrorism. What can one say? A man who visits the toilets and needs to be saved by the craven infidels after he somehow pressed the wrong button or crossed the wrong wires. If you close your eyes, you can just picture him being carried out on a stretcher, his face covered in soot, and smoke rising from his hair and clothes. This is real-life slapstick, ladies and gentlemen, being performed by people who think they are Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. But let us not dally, and instead take a look at the next terrorist with all the cunning and guile of a James Bond villain. On the 22nd of December 2001, Richard Colvin Reed tried to detonate explosives which were packed into his shoes when on an American Airlines flight, the explosives were supposed to be triggered by a match fuse. Having completely forgotten that sweaty feet in an enclosed environment such as shoes might sufficiently dampen fuses as not to make them lightable, Mr. Reed's plans went somewhat awry. Airplane staff were alerted by passengers that one of their fellow travellers apparently was trying to set his shoes on fire with matches. 
Somehow it never occurred to Richard Reed that trying to set your own shoes alight whilst on an airplane might draw the attention of others around you. You may not be overly surprised to learn that Richard Reed, of course, has been sentenced to a long stay in one of America's finest penitentiaries, where he is to serve three consecutive life sentences and 110 years without parole. So it might be some time before Mr. Reed, by now known the world over as the shoe bomber, ever gets the chance to go shopping for a pair of more flammable shoes. But if you thought trying to set your shoes on fire was perhaps a little quirky, please consider Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab. This man, this paragon, decided that the glory of Allah would be best served if he boarded a plane from Amsterdam to Detroit in 2009 and blew himself up. As seems to be the pattern with terrorists, they seem very keen to take to the toilets in times of crisis. Well, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab did just that as the plane was approaching Detroit. Twenty minutes, in fact. When at last our heroic Islamist warrior returned and sat down, his fellow passengers heard popping noises and there was a bad smell. Thereafter, Mr. Abdul Mutalab's trousers seemed to catch fire. He was in fact wearing underpants packed with explosives. His sojourn to the toilet had been, among other things most likely, a chance to inject acid into said explosives in order to set them off. Fortunately, he was another one of those Inspector Gadget-type terrorists, who would sooner set themselves on fire rather than succeed in blowing up anything. So whilst the trusty Dutchman proceeded to restrain Abdul Matalab, and most likely beat the proverbial out of him, the crew directed their fire extinguishers at his crotch. Hmm, this terrorist business seems a touch undignified, does it not? When in court, Mr. Abdul Mutalab had some things to say which, well, make for interesting listening. He must be the first man to refer to a blessed weapon in his underpants, but thereby means some homemade explosives he'd shoved down there earlier. I am not kidding, ladies and gentlemen. He did in fact say that. I find unwitting humour tends to be the best kind. But it seems that the reason Mr. Abdul Mutalab's underpants fail to explode may be an even more inglorious affair. You see, according to the Daily Mail, the reason his underpants failed to go bang was that he had worn them for two weeks. I think it is fair to say that some virgins in Islamist heaven must have been breathing a sigh of relief when they heard that this particular martyr was not arriving to claim their services as a reward for his deeds. When taking a glance at Mr. Abdul Mutalab, you may notice that he looks a little perturbed on his photograph, maybe a touch disheartened. I wonder why that is. After all, he did get his wish to play Chuck Norris on a plane. Well, Chuck Norris's underpants, anyhow. But there could be good reason for Mr. Abdul Mutalab's rather sourly expression. Among other wounds, the incomparable Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab sustained second-degree burns to his genitalia. What can I say? Allah sure works in mysterious ways. But when it comes to terrorism, of course there is always the question, what do we do about it? Now there are many different ways one can attempt a solution. The Americans, in their grandiose sort of way, go completely over the top with drone strikes and stealth bombers. Is it a wonder they even refer to some of their missiles as fire-and-forget systems? I don't know, it must be something they put in all the fizzy sugar water they all seem to consume so avidly. Meanwhile, Britain, on the other hand, is much too timid. Or maybe I should say some of Britain. For it was in November 2014, when, by pure coincidence of course, the Home Secretary was once again trying to get some ludicrous piece of oppressive legislation passed, that police in an attempt to create a little public fear which might aid in the passing of such legislation, were ordered to start handing out leaflets advising citizens what to do in the case of a terrorist attack. Their advice was, and I kid you not, run and hide. Or to be more precise, run, hide and tell. Bravo. That'll show them. But then, on second thought, it is not really on a par with the spirit of Winston Churchill's We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches speech, is it? Who was this craven, cowardly Home Secretary who sought to advise the descendants of Drake, Nelson, Wellington, Lawrence of Arabia and Montgomery to run away and hide? One Theresa May, 
What is she doing these days, you ask? They made her prime minister. And do you know what? She likes to portray herself as a tough, no-nonsense leader. Yes, very tough indeed, madam. Run and hide. Very tough indeed. Maybe the correct approach is neither American bombast nor Theresa May's brand of British wimpishness. Sometimes, you see, sometimes the true spirit can be found in the unlikeliest of places. In this case, when putting up a brave front to terrorists and would-be suicide bombers, it seems to me that the plucky little Scottish town of Lark Hall does it best. Please, ladies and gentlemen, feast your eyes on Lark Hall's town sign welcoming visitors. Take that, Theresa May. The British have still got it. That is all from the Cyber Pass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.